Genome editing describes the ability to modify the DNA genomes of living organisms in controllable ways. So that's modifying in living cells, in living species, rather than taking a piece of DNA out, modifying it with some enzymes, growing it up in bacteria, then put it back again. We're actually modifying in living cells, so in the case of humans, in human cells. Genome editing is critical to the study of genes and gene regula regulatory element functions. So rather than to understand the gene, <clears throat> you take it out of a cell and you study it somewhere else, or you're studying, studying a gene regulatory element like a promoter or an enhancer, and you put that into some kind of reporter assay. With genome editing, you can study a gene or a gene regulatory element in its natural context, its chromosomal context. So you can delete it, mutate it, exchange it, modify it, however you want to, in its natural context. This is very powerful. Genome editing also paves the way for the creation of models for human disease. So you can take the specific mutations that occur in the human population and put them into cell lines or into animal models um, to try and mimic the disease and study very specific molecular aspects of that disease and gain some insight, maybe develop some drugs and test them out. Genome editing also obviously uh, allows for the advanced correction of genetic diseases. So these are advanced gene therapies. So rather than when you've got um, a patient who's got a defective gene, rather than overlaying that with a normal gene, and so those cells in that patient express both the normal and the mutant gene, you can now actually try and correct the mutant gene and get rid of the problems of that mutant gene. Genome editing also um, allows for very um, powerful improvements in the biotechnology and food production sectors. So you could modify uh, microbes or plants to, to make better products for you or be resistant to diseases or easier to handle, whatever it is that's lim limiting in those industries. Um, genome edi editing can now be uh, applied um, should it be safe to do so. Prior to genome editing, uh, a method called gene targeting was used um, um, to, to modify um, genomes. Um, this describes the genetic replacement um, based on cellular homologous recombination machinery. Um, so this is obviously used in yeast an awful lot. Uh, it can be used in mammalian embryonic stem cells and in B cells. But in general, it's very inefficient in most cell types of interest. And for all those applications list listed above, gene targeting just um, it, it is just not useful in most situations. So genome editing involves um, a variety of powerful synthetic biology strategies um, that have been developed to create sequence-specific DNA endonucleases. So these are enzymes that cut a specific DNA sequence uh, of your choosing. Uh, and you, you place those endonucleases um, to, to create the cut exactly where you want to. So if you're trying to knock out a gene, it's going to cut at your specific gene. This then stimulates cellular DNA repair. And DNA repair in fixing that break um, will either make mistakes or you can uh, persuade it and trick it into making specific changes. So the combination of your knowledge of DNA repair and your ability to create these enzymes that will cut where you want them to, you can then modify a target genetic locus precisely and quickly. This is a very, very quick method. So there have been three generations of nucleases that have been created for the use in gene of uh, <clears throat> for their use in genome editing. <clears throat> um, the first um, version um, involved zinc finger nucleases, so sh I shall take you through those. Then um, a better approach came along, um, which are the tail nucleases or talons. 
But in this most modern era, in the last few years, CRISPR really has become uh, the easy, easiest and most applicable uh, method out there. So I'll take you through each of these three things. It's important to consider zinc finger nucleases and tail nucleases and understand them because those are the ones that have made it through to um, clinical trials uh, and a lot of biotech um, applications. So it's important to know what they actually are and what their value is. So looking at double strand break repair pathways, um, so I'm mostly um, going to focus the talk on mammalian systems, but a lot of this is true across eukaryotes. The most dominant pathway of DNA break repair uh, is called non-homologous end joining. It's a very fast uh, set of enzymatic processes which simply join breaks back together again and they ignore the sequence at those breaks. So if you've got multiple breaks present, potentially different ends will get joined to each other. Um, but also um, when joining the correct ends together, um, it can do so in, a, in an error prone way. So on the left is a diagram here of the typical kinds of factors that recognize the breaks, signal the breaks, and then start to um, fill in any ends which aren't blunt and then ligate them together. This kind of repair can be completed in minutes. It's extremely error prone because no template copy is used. And canonical non-homologous end joining can be accurate if, if the ends are, are, are blunt um, and phosphorylated and clean. Um, it can join them back together the way they came apart and it's fine. But if you're using one of these nucleases in genome editing, it's going to cut that site again because you've reinstated the target sequence. And what will happen eventually is that non-homologous end joining will insert an extra base to facilitate the ligation of the ends. And in which case you've got a one base insertion, you've changed the sequence that might inactivate a gene. Um, alternative non uh, uh, alternative um, end joining pathways typically reset the five prime ends at the breaks. So they chew just that one strand back uh, so five prime to three prime resection. And what they're doing is exposing a short sequence, a single stranded sequence to look for local micro homology. So it might just be a couple of A's or a couple of C's and it will join those to a couple of T's or a couple of G's on the, on the other end. Um, and it will ligate through that. So um, those will pair up and there may be bases that will need to be removed um, and so often you get these local deletions. Um, so collectively you get insertions or deletions from non-homologous end joining, and we call them indels for short. And so the outcome of this kind of repair pathway is seemingly random. Um, so if you're trying to create a, a knockout of your favorite gene by targeting a nuclease at the beginning of the gene, then this dominant non-homologous end joining pathways is excellent for creating all these seemingly random mutations and you'll get frame shift mutations in there and you'll get a, a loss of gene expression very, very easily. Um, but actually when people look um, at lots and lots of targets and, and, and repeat uh, genome editing in lots of cells, they find that actually the kind of edits that occur from non-homologous end joining are not random and, and to some degree that they're based on the local sequence context. So you'll see at some sites you always get plus one insertions, at other sites you always get deletions of a particular length because of the local microhomology. A slower but accurate uh, DNA break repair pathway is called homology directed repair. Uh, and this is an enzymatic process that uses a, a, a normal biology, uh, the sister chromatid template for accurate repair. So obviously this is normally associated with DNA replication. So if you've got a stalled replication fork, uh, sometimes the, the system will, will actually cut that fork, create a DNA break, and because you've got a local template available, you can then 
copy that. So we're a set of pro proteins that recognize those breaks, um, reset. Uh, so a key part of homology directed repair is very extensive five prime to three prime resection um, at the break, which exposes a long three prime overhang. This is typically many kilobases in length. This um, three prime break is then um, protected with proteins like uh, um, replication protein A. So they protect their single stranded DNA binding proteins. They protect these three prime ends. They then get exchanged with RAD51, this um, fantastic filament protein. And in combination with the BRCA proteins, these filaments are able to then invade and search a sister copy for a matching sequence. And when it does so, it base pairs up and a strand exchange occurs. Uh, and so you get these holiday junctions where you've got a crossover between um, one chromatid and another. Uh, and then these are resolved and the gaps are filled in. And so what you end up with is, is, is a perfect copy um, from one sister chromatid to another. So this process overall um, can take over an hour, depending on the sequence. So it's quite slow. It's limited to a very specific part of the cell cycle. Um, but potentially, we could use this in genome editing um, to persuade the cell to make a specific change for us. But instead of um, having a sister chromatid as the copy, we would deliver a donor DNA. And that donor could be a plasmid or, or a viral genome that we've introduced into cells. And we do so in excess if we can. And so uh, the exchange of the sequence we're interested in becomes the, the dominant event. So a key thing about considering what's going to happen after you create a DNA break is that you've got this error-prone pathway and then you've got this accurate pathway and they're active at different times in the cell cycle. So non-homologous end joining is, is functional throughout the cell cycle. Um, certainly it's very dominant in G1 and S phase, uh, um, you know, which is w where most of your genome editing is going to be occurring. HDR, on the other hand, is linked to replication, so it's only active when uh, DNA replication is occurring um, throughout S phase, but it accumulates late in S phase. And then in G2, particularly G2 is where a lot of these stalled forks are getting resolved. So if your goal is to undertake destructive gene editing, like creating a gene knockout, then it's very easy. Um, because non-homologous end joining is dominant and you're going to get a lot of cells where, which are, are going to have mutations which are useful to you in that they create frame shifts and that inactivate your gene. If your goal is to under, undertake a, a, an accurate DNA edit, so you're doing gene correction or a specific mutation in a gene regulatory element, you're creating a specific model, um, then somehow you need to deal with all the unwanted non-homologous end joining mutations and you've got to sift through all of this junk to find the cells which have the specific edits that you're interested in and this is a a, a hidden um, problem of genome editing that that a lot of people perhaps don't consider when they first get started so in this slide here, I'm going to show you um, in, in very simplified terms uh, the possible genome editing outcomes you can get just from creating um, DNA breaks using sequence-specific nucleases. So in these cartoons, we've got two strands representing DNA, and, and then this, this cut through here just shows a DNA break that um, we have introduced with our nuclease. So if we just cut in a place of interest so that's a promoter, uh, early exons of a gene, then we get insertions and deletions occur because of non-homologous end joining. And so we can disrupt that gene's function or that regulatory element's function. If we um, provide uh, a donor DNA at the same time, so that could be a linear piece of DNA, or it could be a plasmid which we are going to cut at either end uh, with our nucleases at the same time as cutting our genomic target, then without any 
um, special homology arms or special processes. So this is just using non-homologous end joining. You will get insertion of your uh, sequence of interest. It's nearly always a trans gene. Um, so I've coloured it green here in case it's, it could be a, a GFP trans gene, say. Um, and you will get insertion at that target site. But the key thing is that you've got no control over the orientation of that insertion. It can go in either way. And also the ends either side of the insertion um, will be uh, will have these indels on them. So, so you may lose or gain sequences. So if it's important for you to, uh, for example, in the case of perhaps you wanted to, to uh, tag the C-terminus of, of a gene uh, and create a GFP fusion or, or a fusion of, of, of another long tag, in that case, your insertion needs to be the correct orientation and it needs to be in the correct open reading frame as your gene. And with this kind of approach, very few of your cells are going to achieve that. Um, but potentially, for example, in the case of a GFP fusion, you can you can easily select for those cells. So if it's very inefficient knock-in and very inefficient at creating the, the correct knock-in, um, those cells are still bright green. So you'll be able to um, sort them out through flow cytometry, for example. So it depends on your application. Sometimes you can just do it this very simple, quick way. Alternatively, you could make quite large genomic rearrangements um, just by cutting twice. So let's say you've got a gene locus which you want to invert for some reason. You can just cut either side of it and the cell, when repairing those breaks, may put that insert back into its normal location but do so the wrong way around and obviously alternatively probably more dominantly um, you will lose that fragment and you'll end up with a deletion so that's just simply cutting with two nucleases at the same time no other tricks so a small percentage of cells will make these big edits for you and we have done this we, we've we've deleted out several genes from a gene cluster uh, just by cutting twice and not doing anything else and you get a decent number of cells that uh, have made that edit for you and, and you can do some experiments on them. Alternatively, you, you, you may want to persuade the cell to use homology directed repair for you. So for example, let's say we want to knock in a gene at a specific location. Um, so in this case, we're gonna cut the target locus with our nuclease, so that's the target locus here. And then you'll have a donor fragment which contains the sequence you want to insert. But importantly, that fragment has to be flanked by homology arms, which are the same sequences as what's found at the either side of the break at the genomic target. So this sequence here would be placed here. This sequence here would be placed there. And um, strand, strand exchange would be used, um, uh, would occur using these homology arms. Um, and in the case of, of, of sort of traditional HDR where you're knocking in large gene fragments, um, you need at least 750 bases uh, in length for that homology arm, and the longer the better. Alternatively, um, you may just want to make um, precise edits. So let's say you've got um, a defective gene and you're wanting to correct it with the real gene. Um, you would cut as close as possible to the, the where you want the change to occur. Um, and then you'd have a, a donor fragment, again, like you've seen on the left here, with these homology arms. So if you're wanting to exchange a, a, a large gene sequence, then you do need these long homology arms. But let's say you're just making um, an edit of one, two, or three bases, um, as is typical for most human genetic diseases then it's been shown that your donor fragment can actually be very short indeed. So actually now people use oligonucleotides, so very short uh, single-stranded DNA fragments. You, you only need one strand, which will have the edit, which may be one, two or three bases. And then that can just be flanked by 40 bases, four zero bases of um, homology arm. And that's sufficient to get uh, an exchange to occur. And so this has now become 
um, was until very recently uh, the main way that you would make precise edits of a gene. Thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments below what you thought of it. Um, please give us a like and certainly think of subscribing. I've got a lot more content on this channel, which you can see uh, in the playlists coming up. Thanks.